All right, I'm going to admit all. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Bobby Wilding. I'm the executive director of Clean and Healthy New York. And uh, we are so glad to have you here. And we are going to um, fully launch this webinar in just a moment. We're just taking care of some of the final uh, details to make sure we're all set. So just one moment, we will get started. So I wanna remind folks now that um, throughout the conversation, we'll be taking questions in the chat for our speakers. So if you have questions as they're talking, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I will be um, reviewing that to make sure that we have a good conversation and um, get answers to your questions. Um, and we are ready to get started. So um, as I said, I'm Bobby Wilding. I'm the executive director for Clean and Healthy New York. For those of you who may not be as familiar with us, we are a environmental health advocacy organization that is uh, focused on building a just and healthy world in which toxic chemicals are just simply unthinkable. And uh, we do that work by uh, changing policies, shifting marketplaces and engaging and empowering people. And tonight we're in our third of our 2022 monthly series, uh, webinar series that we've been hosting this year. It's a new program for us. And I'm really delighted to um, be here tonight talking with you about intersections, the impact of toxics on women and how toxic chemicals affect women's health. And so tonight we have a great panel of uh, speakers. Uh, we, have, we will be having Senator uh, Cordell Clear uh, joining us a little bit later. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Janet Gray, who is an emerita professor at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. She's also now the Interim Director of Science for Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, which is a national organization. Um, we're also joined by Leah Segedy, who's the founder of Momovation. Uh, she is an author and uh, a uh, community organizer and a rabid tester of all manner of products to help us understand what's hiding uh, in things that we use every day. And I think this is going to be a great conversation for us to have this evening. So um, to kick it off, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Janet Gray. Janet? Thank you so much, Bobby. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, as I said to Bobby a minute ago, that uh, doing the science of women's health in five minutes is a little bit crazy, but um, I'm going to try to at least cover a few really important points. So first, we need to start with the realization that there are over 80,000 chemicals currently in commerce in the United States, and that very few of them have been studied for their effects on human health. So we're going to be talking about a very limited uh, subset of the chemicals that are out there. Um, giving a list of the or overview of the actual chemicals of concern would take probably an hour. Um, so let me just give you a, a, a little inkling of some of the uh, places where women are exposed and you'll hear more about um, some of them I'm sure when Lee is talking, but uh, occupational exposures, for example, uh, women who work in beauty and nail salons, very high levels in factories and other uh, manufacturing sites and hospitals, all of which women are, um, are uh, disproportionately found as workers. Uh, in products in homes and in other people's homes, cleaning products, uh, cosmetics and other personal uh, care products, especially those that are targeted at uh, Black and other BIPOC women. Feminine hygiene and menstruation products and on and on and on. So these are um, chemicals that are found in common everyday uh, products to which we're all exposed. Well, how do these exposures um, affect women's health? Just uh, knowing they're out there doesn't mean that they're bad. 
Um, but we know that some like benzene, formaldehyde radiation are what I would consider classical carcinogen. They increase the risk of uh, cancer by altering cell metabolism, by causing DNA mutations and otherwise changing um, cell division. But the chemicals that we're going to be talking about uh, for the most part tonight and of greatest concern for women's health are a category of chemicals that are called endocrine disrupting compounds or EDCs. This is a fairly recent, uh, recently found uh, group of chemicals and as their name suggests, they interfere or disrupt the body's natural endocrine or hormonal system. So they're called endocrine disrupting compounds or EDCs. Um, and what you really need to know as background is that many parts of our bodies are just exquisitely sensitive to the effects of small amounts of circulating hormones. And if we disrupt the signal, uh, it can actually have very profound effects. And our of particular concern um, for women's health are the EDCs that interfere with our own natural estrogens and thyroid hormone. And there are just a slew of these chemicals out there. So EDCs actually work in a somewhat different way, actually a quite profoundly different way than many other chemicals. They have characteristics that are very specific to EDCs. First of all, as the name suggests, we've already said, they, um, they disrupt the normal chemical or the normal hormones like estrogen or thyroid. And as with the regular or normal hormones that are in our body, they work at really, really low doses, at doses that are low enough to be comparable to what our exposures are through using um, uh, products that contain these chemicals or that are found in the air or water around us. So low doses matter. Um, windows of susceptibility is really another critical term that is we, at, at certain ages, we are particularly susceptible to the effects of these, um, of these EDCs. Of particular concern is in gestation, fetal development, early childhood, around puberty, uh, during pregnancy and lactation. So these are times when our body, our bodies are just rapidly, rapidly changing, cells are dividing really quickly, and they can be uh, disrupted and abnormal uh, development can occur as a result. And finally, and this is a little wonky for a minute, but it's important, um, these, these effects of these uh, EDCs can be what we say is nonlinear. That is, we usually think a little bit causes a little damage and a lot causes a lot of damage. But the EDCs, they have a very different kind of response curve, more like an inverted U, so that at very low doses, there are one set of um, negative impacts. And at very high doses, there are a different set of negative impacts. And in medium doses, way above what we're exposed to, there may be relatively little impact. Um, I know that may be a little bit of counterintuitive, but there's good science and good rationale for that. Um, Finding. But the important things are, so low doses, um, low doses that matter and that matter at particular times in life. So why might women might be particularly susceptible to the effects of EDCs? Um, it's not that men aren't, but one factor is that pound for pound, we just have more body fat than men do. And these EDCs, they're what's called lipophilic or fat loving. They are gathered up by um, and stored by the fat in our bodies. And then over time, slowly from days to sometimes weeks, months, even years and decades, they release these chemicals into our body uh, where they continue to exert these negative impacts. So what are some of these negative impacts? Um, one is altering uh, the time of puberty. We know that puberty is happening earlier and earlier, especially uh, in young girls and especially in young Black African-American girls for whom normal puberty is still is now being considered at ages six to eight. Just incredible. 
Um, and these changes in the timing of puberty have paralleled very closely um, the increase in our exposures uh, to, to these toxic chemicals. In addition, we have changes in breast development leading to an increased risk of breast cancer, uh, other chemicals related uh, to increases in endometriosis, the presence of uterine tissue outside the uterus proper, uh, an increase in both childhood and later adulthood obesity, uh, and then a variety of developmental disorders, including at the early age, ADHD and autism, at later ages, more intense and earlier Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention women as mothers. Most studies of the effects of these exposures are actually on outcomes in um, the children, the developing child. But there are also effects of these exposures on pregnant women at a time when they're particularly susceptible um, to these environmental factors. There's an inc increased risk of preeclampsia, high blood pressure, and often liver and kidney damage, uh, gestational diabetes, and breast cancer, and spontaneous uh, miscarriage, to uh, mention a few. And then finally, I really must emphasize that these effects of exposures to environmental toxicants are greatly, greatly exacerbated for BIPOC women, and more generally for women living, under, living in under-resourced communities. They have much higher exposures to environmental toxins for a whole lot of reasons. They have often lower access to healthier alternatives. And the stress of living in um, socially and economically uh, stressed communities interacts with the physiology uh, in either additive or synergistic ways to just increase uh, the effects of these chemicals of exposure. So it's really critical that the science as well as policy is really done through an understanding of health impacts of environmental toxicants through social and racial justice lenses. So I'm going to stop there and um, let Leah, I guess, and look forward to the conversation later. Am I on, Bobby? It's lovely to be after right after Janet. She's awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Segedy. I'm from Momovation.com. I'm also the founder of ShipCon, social media conference for bloggers. And um, I do a lot of things online. Um, so Momovation has been around for, oh, I think it's 13 years now. And if you want to uh, a community of like-minded women who are really concerned about the things that Janet is talking about, this is the place for you. Um, essentially what we do in Momovation is it's a community of women, but we also do investigations on literally every single thing that you could ever bring into your home, personal care products, food, consumer products, cleaning products, anything that would impact your hormones of your children, of you, yourself, your husband, your partner, or anybody else. Because ultimately the goal at Momovation is to help you feel less stressed out because this stuff is already stressful enough, right? So one of the things I wanted to say is just basically, you know, echo a little of the things that Janet said when she was talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. And um, one of my main advisors is Pete My Myers, and he's the man that coined the phrase endocrine disrupting chemicals many years ago. And so we, we refer to him as the godfather in Momovation for that exact reason. He's a lot of fun to be around and um, he helps, uh, you know, inform most of our work, a lot of our work with basic principles. And one of those things is, you know, there's certain times when you really want to be concerned about these things. And of course, utero um, pregnancy is one of those big times. And of course, when your children are smaller, and then of course, when your children go through puberty and a lot of the women um, that are in our community have children at those ages. And so that's the time to pay attention. We also don't wanna scare you into freaking out over everything being toxic. And what we'd rather do is help you understand like bad, better, best categories. So if you go to our website, you can find pretty much anything you would ever purchase. Like for instance, we're doing bubble baths this week. I haven't put it up yet, but we're working on bubble, bubble baths. And so we're looking at the hundred plus bubble baths that there are and dividing it into not our favorite, 
better and best. And so a lot of times the better and the best brands, it's, it's your decision between those two areas. The better brands are typically available at your local grocery store. Sometimes they may be less expensive. The best brands are sometimes only available online or not as easy to get if you walk into your store, but we're trying to get everybody at every place in your life. And so it's kind of like that idea that come as you are and we'll help you with whatever you need at whatever time you need it. And a lot of the things that we've been working on lately um, is perfluorinated chemicals, so PFAS chemicals. And I know Janet didn't talk about those directly, but that's a lot of our investigations that we've been doing a lot because when we were doing um, these investigations, we were realizing that a lot of the big, big issues are not something that's on the ingredient label, but it's something that's actually outside of the ingredient label. They're indirect additives that are used in manufacturing. And sometimes they get into the food product or the personal care product in larger amounts or smaller amounts. And, and we want to know how much is in a product. So for instance, um, Momovation looks at PFAS. Now PFAS is one of those chemicals that are it's, it's really, really bad. In the, in the world of the big bad wolf, I'd say that was one of the big bad wolves kind of a chemical. And we have, we think that this chemical will be banned eventually, or a lot of them will be banned, but we're kind of getting to that route and we're not there yet. So as this happens, while the different agencies are kind of working it out and there's a lot of science going back and forth, our job is to make sure that you're informed about where it is and where it's going to be and, you know, how you can find it. So some of the investigations we've done is we've looked at all the period underwear, most of the popular period underwear out there and been able to test it for PFAS to see if it's on the crotch, you know, I'd want to know. We've also done bamboo flooring. We've done parchment paper, five different parchment papers and looked at that. We've done ketchups. Um, that's another thing. One of our most popular is green beauty makeup, where we tested um, 81 different products of green beauty makeup from 49 different brands to show you if we could find any detectable levels of organic fluorine, indications of that in there. Um, yoga pants, that went viral. We looked at 32 different brands of yoga pants and the crotch area and about 25% of the yoga pants that you can probably purchase have PFAS in the crotch area. We also looked at sports bras. We did 23 different sports bras and, and found PFAS in the that um, fabric right next to your nipple. So we're trying to do a lot of things for the greater good to try to help people with finding these very specific chemicals that are endocrine disrupting, that are absolutely a problem that we know are hormone disrupting and, and helping people understand where they are and where they're not. And the job of the audience is to buy from the better brands and encourage the better brands and then kind of tell the brands that are, have stuff in there, hey, you might want to take care of that. And the next time I'll buy your product. And so we kind of look at our, our job here in this space is, you know, gathering the science from our advisors, you know, gathering all the products together, you know, helping people make sense of those crazy chemical names, right? And putting into groups, putting it out there in such a way so that it's easy for the average person to understand and, you know, what they should buy and what they shouldn't buy, but then also providing like a supportive community where people can be stressed out, you know, and people can kind of say, this is too much. And you know what the answer is? It is too much. You're absolutely right. It's not your fault. If, if these types of things bother you, you're not alone. You're not alone in thinking that, and you're not alone in thinking that this isn't fair. This shouldn't be happening. You're absolutely right that it shouldn't be. But at the end of the day, we all got to grab hold of each other's hands and we're women. We got to make it work. Right. And so we got to bang the door down and make sure that they hear, you know, what, what our desires are and, and, and hear these brands here that we want clean and safer products. We want them to stop using these types of contaminants that are really problematic to the development of our children. And that's what Momovation does. So, um, uh, Bobby, I had about five, 10 minutes. If you want me to go on, I can keep going. Um, uh, Thanks but so much, Leah. That's, that's great. And, um, I think that that, you know, the, the story that the two of you have been sharing really, you know, is clearly these are problems that we are facing in ways that we never expected. And, uh, we, you know, at Clean and Healthy New York, uh, we we often take the research that Leah's turning out and we share it with le legislators. Um, 
And tonight we will be hearing hopefully from uh, Senator Clear. Um, she's making sure her schedule works. I know she was in transit, um, but is definitely trying to join us. So whenever she's able to join us, we will jump over to that. But I will say that, you know, we think that you shouldn't have to shop your way out of this. Um, you should be able to walk into the store with the confidence that most people who don't know about these issues do, believing that if it's on the store shelf, that it is safe. Um, that is absolutely the standard that we should be adhering to um, because people don't have time to go and become their own toxicologists. It's not, we can't all be Leah going and buying things and sending them off to the lab. Um, and, so and Leah can't test every single product, right? For every single chemical. Um, and so, you know, we've, uh, we've talked in some of our previous webinars about the policy work that we're doing. One of the, the key bills that we're working to advance this year is around personal care products, um, both working to get uh, information about what's in the products, because uh, even though there is uh, a, um, there's a lot of information on the label, um, there are things that are hidden still. So the words like fragrance or uh, colorant or flavor, if you're putting on flavored lipstick, um, they don't have to tell you what's inside those terms. And we think that you should know. And, and on top of that, as a lot of Leah's testing has illuminated, there are contaminants from the manufacturing process or from the raw materials that also can contribute to our, uh, our health hazards. And, um, and we don't know what those are and most of the time. Um, and so we're working on a policy that would do that. And then on top of that, also restrict uh, the whole class of PFAS chemicals in personal care products. Mercury, which is still showing up in skin lightening cream, which has got its own deeply racist problematic components to it. Um, but it is- you know, People um, use that when they want to get rid of their freckles too, because I used that when I was a kid. Uh -huh. so it's it, it's got a bunch of different applications that are definitely colorism questions that come into play with that. And regardless if you're choosing that, you should not also be getting toxic mercury along with it. Mm -hmm. um, and a host of other chemicals. Uh, California already restricted some of these chemicals and um, has done uh, work to expand the amount of information that we get. We're hoping New York can come in as a second heavy counterweight on the East Coast um, because it's hard to move things through Congress right now. That's incredibly difficult to get a law passed that is really strong and powerful in the, at the federal level right now. Um, and, uh, and so state policy, that's where clean and healthy New York has been, uh, living. Um, and, you know, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can go about solutions. And, uh, I think it is, uh, really critical that we're advancing all of them. Um, so Janet, I was just, I was wondering if you could just share with our audience, if they had like one fact that they walked away with from here, you know, that they could share with other people or they could use if they're talking with people who, who are decision makers, like what would that, like, is there a clear thing that you think people should just walk away as a talking point? Well, I, th I think both you and Leah have, have covered this in many ways. I think it's really important. We should not have to be organic chemists to do our day-to-day -day shopping and living. Um, knowing that there are toxic chemicals in so many products is scary. Um, and we need to be able to, through legislative action, through marketing action, through loads of ways, um, try to get them out of products. But having a little understanding of why they're scary and how they work um, makes a much more powerful story. So, so to you know, be a little bit knowledgeable, um, not to worry a whole lot about a lot of the science. And then I guess finally, in your personal life to just step by step, you know, you can't do it all at once. You know, try getting rid of uh, plastic from the kitchen and then go to the next and the next and the next. And suddenly your lifestyle will change. I think she says that really well. Um, and I also say, if you're going to eat an elephant, you got to take a bite at a time, right? So when you start off, you see this big, huge element, elephant, and it's overwhelming, and you don't know a lot about it. You don't even know its name. You want to get him out of your kitchen, right? And so you know, what do you, what do you say? And I think a lot of people either run at it and try to do everything they possibly can, or they just freak out and, and 
neither way is actually going to work. We actually recommend that you do little tiny in incremental changes little by little by little. And I mean, like, through, and if you have also, if you have a family and they're not little babies, they might be a little like pissed off about you changing their lifestyle. So that's why it's even better to go the slow route because, you know, it's not as painful. And that's really the secret. You could plan out like this month, I'm changing this. Next month, I'm changing that so that they have nothing really to yell about. It's just like an eye roll that becomes a habit, you know? And so those eye rolls become a habit. That is fine. You're the mom. You can take care of all this stuff. You know, I just, we just kind of want everyone to be kind of in a better frame of mind. Like you don't want to be stressed out you know, let us stress out, like let Janet and me do the stressing and Bobby do the stressing and we can just help you with everything else, you know, and, and honestly, that's what I'm hoping, you know, that people can come, come away, you know, just mostly in general is that, you know, it's not, it's not about the stress. It's about finding resources and finding your people to help and slow. Thanks. I, uh, I appreciate that perspective, I think it's, you know, again, it's not, we didn't create this problem as ordinary human beings trying to just get through our days. You know, um, this is a problem that was created by companies that wanted to cut corners and make things as cheap as possible. Um, and pushback is really, um, is critical. And uh, so one of the questions in the, or one of the comments that was in, in the um, chat was if you can, read the ingredients, then it's better for you to use. And Michelle, are you saying if you can understand what the ingredients are that it's better to use? Is that what you were thinking of? Is like um, whole foods are better than really complex chemical names? Yeah, I think that that's largely true that whole foods are better, but the, the thing that you don't know is what's what the manufacturing process was. Um, well, the other things is there's so many safe, chemically sounding names in personal care and cleaning products. Just want to warn you ladies about that. For food, that will work every time, right? So you can make that basic stance for food. But when you're coming into another realm of category, sometimes it's this long word that's this long and it literally means extract of olive leaf branch. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you don't have to do that to me, but that's, that's an ingredient label, you know? Um, so yes and no. Janet's probably got a better ID on that one. You're on mute, Janet. Janet, um, you're on mute. So sorry. Um, you need to know the sources of even just food items because they may have pesticides and they may have loads of other things. And again, that can get overwhelming, but buying as fresh as possible from sources you know as well as possible. Uh, and yes, uh, sim simplifying um, a lot of what, what you, especially what you eat, because that's so obviously you're taking it into your body. And then the other thing to add on top of that is processing it yourself in your kitchen. So you know how grandma was cooking from scratch? Well, that food that you've cooked from scratch probably has less PFAS and phthalates in it and other indirect additives that are used at the manufacturing plant. So even if it's not organic, um, cooking it from scratch kind of gets rid of a lot of those things that we're really concerned about in momovation as well. But yeah, pesticides are a big issue. But then of course, if you're worried about pesticides, you can do things like buy more organic food and shop at the shop with the dirty dozen list and the clean 15. And that's on EWG. Yeah. So there's, there are a lot of sources for making some of those choices. It is, it's, you know, a really challenging uh, environment to be in right now, I think. Um, because, you know, a lot of times what we talk about are the personal care products or sort of those, um, things that come in bottles. Um, but the, the bottles themselves can be problematic, you know, and a lot of, you know, a lot of these chemicals also show up in other everyday items that we use around our homes. So things like flame retardant chemicals showing up in, uh, less and less in furniture. In New York, actually, we passed a Family and Firefighter Protection Act last year that uh, banned uh, flame retardants in furniture and bedding and for the first time uh, took action on um, flame retardants in computer cases. But, you know, they show up in places that you don't anticipate. And I will tell you that one of the things that I've been surprised at is, as you were talking about, Leah, the hidden places the PFAS shows up 
right? Like it's not what unbelievable, it? right? Like, but or sports bras, right? Like that I didn't, bras, yeah. You know, um, it is. It can the be a real challenge. The yoga pants, because we tested all the round the pants, you know. And then I was like, "Come on, guys, I get it, but like it's the outer layer." you know, like really don't make him a sweat, you know, like, I don't understand what this is about, you know, but we, we are finding it in the most unusual places. Sometimes, you know, we're going to, we're going to do some um, new investigations that are coming out where we've got cooking oils, pasta sauce, nut butters, and tooth floss, toilet paper, and tampons are coming too. And so I'm finding it in unusual places where I'm not expecting it. And so, you know, um, the whole point here is, you know, when I'm actually talking to a lot of these brands behind the scenes sometimes, and a lot of them are even surprised that these, these things appear in their products. Some of them, I don't believe a lot of them. I do believe, um, because testing for very specific things isn't mandated. And then there's issues with the laws that are, you know, a lot of us are trying to work on right now. And at the, at the federal level where, you know, the middlemen are not mandated to be transparent about what is, what they're using to process things, to give that to the brand. And so there's a lot of work that has to be done, um, to keep us all safe, you know, and at the end of the day, it's kind of like laziness, greed, money, and I think there needs to be more women in, in power is another thing I think needs to happen. But, you know, that's another issue completely. So, um, Janet, I don't know if you have thoughts about um, what kind of policy priorities we should be having or what we should be thinking about in, in policy right now. I obviously have thoughts, but um, I'm just curious, like from a science perspective, what what would be on your wish list for um uh, taking on policy? Well, I mean, clearly PFASs are just absolutely critical as a number one. The whole class has to be banned from regular products. Um, it's a class of uh, over 9,000 chemicals and we can't do things one by one. So uh, th that's a starting point. Um, I think also taking on a, a lot of the acts that that uh, CHNY, BCPP, other organizations have been involved in are really sort of focused on consumer product angles rather than particular chemicals. So getting uh, labeling on, um, well, there's cleaning products or cosmetics and personal care products, whatever. I think for me, one of the big ones is fag fragrance, just really forcing uh, companies to disclose uh, on, on, on uh, on the actual product as well as on their website, more information about what, what constitutes their fragrance. They don't have to give the exact formulation, but what are the chemicals in and why we, we know for many of them that they are, are um, actually of um, real concern for health. So I guess those would be my two biggies for starting points. Yeah, I think that taking action on classes of chemicals instead of doing them one by one is going to be the big, a huge challenge. It's the, it's a big, it's a big next step that I think we have to take. And we did, we are starting to do that in New York with bands. It's a little bit easier, but the, you know, when you look at the way that both state and federal laws were created and regulations were created to deal with chemicals, it's really like they're individual human beings, right? They're innocent until proven guilty and they each get taken on a case by case basis. Well, just because, you know, a very similar, um, you know, uh, chemical like looks very similar, doesn't mean that we should be concerned about it. And that's all great. We should be not, you know, we shouldn't be treating families like one family member is a criminal, therefore we're all criminals. But when it comes to chemicals, we really need to flip the script, right? We really have to flip it to being the opposite of how we treat people. Um, you know, we, we ban BPA and baby bottles and sippy cups in New York, and now we see that bisphenols are problematic in a, you know, as, as a whole class. Janet, do you want to add to that? Well, that's, what I, that's what I was going to say is the classic example is BPS and BPF, which are the so-called regrettable substitutions for BPA are actually more estrogenic, worse than the original BPA. Yeah, we did a it little is. on BPS, uh, 
the year before COVID or two years before COVID. And um, Pete, our main advisor, was the most concerning part of everyday lives was thermal receipt paper. That's your biz biggest exposure of bisphenols because the part of the problem with that receipt paper is it's a powder that's on the top of the receipt. It's not bonded inside plastic. So no chemical reaction needs to happen like heat or what have you for you to get impacted. Um, and so the people that we were really concerned with, of course, was women who you know were shopping all the time, but also pregnant women at the register, you know, who are handling it all day long. So we did a change.org petition against Target. Um, it took about 50,000 signatures and me getting in a boardroom with them and kind of, you know, shaking my finger at them saying, I'll be back, you know. But then the funny thing was, is they told me, no, we're not doing this. And they literally started working on it right away. And within a year it was done, but they didn't announce it for two years. So I was uh, like, y'all should have just been honest with me saying you were going to do it, you know, instead of that, but happy as can be. Um, but then CVS, they reformulated their paper, you know, it's target. I know Best Buy has great paper. Trader Joe's has better paper, but that's one of those things that Pete was really concerned with, with bisphenols was the receipt paper. Sorry. So I just want to say that we have Senator Clear here with us, um, New York State are clear, very recently elected to office, longtime community advocate, um, working on uh, lead and many other issues. And uh, Senator Clear, you should be able to turn on your camera if you're able to do that. And we would love to hear from you about how you, your perspective on the impact of toxics on, on women. Oh, okay. All right. Hold on, let me try again. It wasn't letting me, so I'll try it again. Oh, I got it. Okay, good. Hi, how's everybody doing this evening? And I'm sorry uh, for the delay. My schedule is really crazy. I was trying to get back to my district today from Albany, and that took a little time. So thank you for including me in this very important Women's History Month panel uh, and the impact of toxins on women. As a proud lifelong member of We Act for Environmental Justice, a long time uh, collaborator with Clean and Healthy New York. Um, one of my chief goals as state senator and chair of the Women's Issues Committee is to create an environment that is toxin free, particularly for women and communities of color, uh, pregnant women and those caring for children. Um, now I haven't uh, taken it down to just the toxins that are affecting women because we, we, we have toxins that affect uh, all of us, whether we're women, and especially if we have things that affect our children, they definitely affect us. So <clears throat> many of you know about my son who was exposed at a vulnerable age to lead and other related uh, airborne toxins, and this affected him for life. And it affected me as well. The number of people it affected in our own familial and neighborhood circle is in the thousands. Um, now, if you extrapolate that to every child who has asthma, every other child who has asthma was exposed to a toy with toxins in it or lead or asbestos in an apartment or mold or used an unsafe health product or as a child of someone who has, you can see how prevalent the scourge of toxins is in our world on both the micro and macro level and to parents and mothers uh, and grandmothers and other people in our community. Um, that is why our work together is so important. We know that toxins affect women in a different way. We know they are behind the rise in many cancers that disproportionately affect particularly women of color. We know that sadly, <clears throat> they can quote case from mother to child in the womb. And we know the reasons, uh, I'm sorry, we know that they can, and it's because of these reasons, the more that I plan on using the Women's Issues Committee to explore the impact of toxins on women and to make sure that these disparate impacts are accounted for and eradicated. In addition, I proudly support the following budget priorities of clean and healthy New York. <clears throat> One billion in dollar investment to reduce lead poisoning in housing. Um, in New York City, I was fortunate enough to work with parents, a coalition of great people, uh, people from all walks of life, tenants, housing organizers, legal uh, services, um, 
healthcare providers, doctors, and others uh, to get landmark legislation passed here in New York City. But it has always troubled me that we have never been able to get that for the other children in New York State. And, um, you know, New York State has the highest number of children with lead poisoning due to uh, children that are identified with elevated blood lead levels. And meanwhile, uh, New York State has the largest number of homes built prior to 1978 before lead paint was outlawed. We have to make a lead safe New York for all children. And that, that is why I support a billion dollar investment to reduce lead poisoning and housing. The more I researched and looked at how lead poisoning looks across the state, um, I know that there are different challenges and New York City has uh, some of the same, but many are different, even right down to the uh, county's health departments, if in, and where they exist. Uh, uh, and housing and enforcement and things on that level. And also even the type of homeowners and uh, not making lead be uh, something that causes people to be homeless. So, you know, I know it's a sensitive issue, but I know this money will be helped, uh, will be used to help eradicate uh, lead poisoning throughout the state. I also uh, supported in the budget $5 million to support environmental justice initiatives. Um, we need this investment to rectify disproportionate harm to black, indigenous, and other people of color communities in low income neighborhoods. Um, I can tell you as a resident of Harlem, we lived with, we live with uh, the largest number of bus depots uh, in the borough and even in, for some parts of the city. Um, my, you know, uh, one of our parks this, that the state, uh, Riverbank State Park, was the give back to the community for locating a waste treatment plant in this community. We have many, many toxic, um, toxic spaces in our communities, not to mention brownfields and other things that need to be cleaned up. Um, so we hope that this, uh, this money will uh, help to reverse some of those conditions that we know are dangerous for families. And once again, this is, we all live here. So this is dangerous for women. This is dangerous for children. It's dangerous for families. Um, we also support it in the budget and this is in the one house. So we're hoping that it stays in and I'm gonna be fighting to make sure it stays in. $4 million for the New York State Children's Environmental Health Centers. Uh, this investment will provide critical support to pediatric centers to identify, treat, and prevent diseases with environmental origins, such as lead poisoning. Uh, $7.5 million to the Pollution Protection Institute and $500,000 to the Interstate, interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse uh, for staff expansion. These organizations are important to New York State for addressing environmental health issues as they pertain to toxic chemicals. And I support the increased staffing at the Department of Environmental Conservation. And although the responsibilities of the Department of DEC have increased since the agency opened in 1970, staff numbers have not. So that puts the agency in jeopardy of not fulfilling its important duties to protect and consumers from harm. So there are two things that I've learned. Uh, we need legislation and we need policy, but we also need to put funding behind it. Uh, and enforcement behind it. Uh, even with the lead laws in New York City, uh, they're nothing if they uh, don't get enforced. Um, so, you know, I, like I said, I worked with the community and a coalition of folks and uh, people in, in, in government uh, to make sure that these initiatives and these policies are created, but not only created, they have to be funded and they have to be enforced if they're really going to be effective. And I'm committed to that in my work uh, in the Senate. And I really appreciate the work that this organization is doing and all the people who are on here tonight and um, count me as an ally uh, and a friend. Thank still you so in the much. Fight. Thank you so much, Senator Clear. We appreciate all of that and hearing the good news about some of those lines that have made it into the one house. And also just really appreciate your taking the time to come and talk with us this evening and look forward to working with you and winning these uh, policy advancement and funding. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And I saw in the chat when I came on, there was a question about some legislation that I 
if I'm on or not. I don't remember all these numbers. So if <laughs> that's, the, that's the personal case. care products, the Safe Personal Care uh, and Cosmetics Act. Um, I'm so sure I'm on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it even sounds like one of my might be sponsoring. But yes, I'm certain that I'm on that bill. Um, but if there's anything else, I look forward to you letting you and others letting me know. Chris Labarge is my uh, legislative person in Albany. Please let me know if there's something. We don't know everything all the time, but call us, send me an email, let us know if there's something that we need to be on and we will uh, definitely review it and make sure that we're supporting the right things. Great. Thank you so much, Senator. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I'm going to go. All right. And yes, we know that uh, this was a busy evening and I'm sure the days in Albany are incredibly long at this point. Uh, so it's, uh, what it's, an it's that time of year. Story. I didn't, I'm, I'm from California. I didn't, I didn't know her until today and I'm just impacted just from hearing about her child being lead poisoned and what a, what a, what, like the most pure of heart as I can find is something like that, a mother who really did live some horrors that she never wants to see happen to anybody else and is fighting her butt off to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's inspiring. Yeah, um, and we are really lucky to have her as a champion in the Senate. And um, yeah, and so for folks that have been asking, the, the bill numbers um, in the chat are the personal care products bill that both uh, Senator Rivera and Assemblyman Gottfried introduced. Um, and we're hoping to see that move. I think there are some technical tweaks to that bill that we'll see come out, but it is, I think, a really powerful um, approach to both require disclosure about a broad list of chemicals and then start taking action on the worst. Um, it's sort of the same thing that we were talking about in uh, the, our personal lives. It is unfortunately challenging to get companies to move. Uh, and the more voices that we can lift up and the more folks that can speak out, uh, I think that also helps tremendously. Mia, you've been building out your, your group of momovation and mama activists. You want to just talk a little bit about what, you know, how do folks get involved and, and what kind of things do you all do together? I mean, we're like rabble rousers. I mean, honestly, like that's kind of before there was rabble rousing. There, we we've been we've been rabble rousing for for oh, uh, I want to say seventeen years in social media, but officially as Momovation has been like thirteen years. So you know, our our community has has just been based on you know, um, toxins and health and stuff like that. And, you know, I come at it where my father um, died from asbestos poisoning, you know, so I really do understand, you know, how these types of issues can impact an entire family and just, you know, destroy things. And it's, it's, it's real. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I loved hearing her story, because it's like, I love, I love people that come at it with a similar heart. I feel like I have something in common with them, you know? And, and so what have we done? We've done all kinds of stuff. I mean, um, when we were trying to label uh, GMOs in California, you know, I raised my hand and volunteered because I used to work in politics back in the day and organized 650 mom bloggers and social media to talk about labeling. And we did it didn't matter where you lived. We had Canadians and you know, people from the United States. And that was kind of where we really got our start with, I would say, green or eco activism. And it was that idea about food transparency being a primary issue of, mo of momovation was about 2011, I would say. And since then, We've been working working on toxins and, and chemicals ever since. A couple of the other things I talked about was Target receipts. That was one of the enemy number one was bisphenols. You know, for my advisor, he's done a lot of work on bisphenols, and so I really wanted to be able to make an impact there. And you know, we we targeted Target because we you know evaluated our our audience and we said where do you shop and target was the one brand that everybody shopped at you know it didn't matter east coast west coast had a lot of money poor you know it didn't matter everybody was at target for some reason and so 
we, we talked to Target and eventually they saw it our way and it's, you know, then CVS and there's a lot of thermal receipt paper issues out there still, but you know, there's little by little, we try to make an impact. Um, another thing is we do, as we do testing recently, it's been our testing and things that have come out of our testing. So, um, I think it was three years ago or two years ago, we looked at glyphosate levels in organic pea protein and regular pea protein. And we actually uncovered some fraud in the organic industry. And it became a big deal because we actually found more glyphosate in a brand called Orgain than was in regular conventional pea protein. And so we went public with that. And that was really difficult. The USDA got involved and that's kind of scary, but luckily I didn't have to deal with a lot of that. Um, the lab did. But um, that really kind of highlighted some issues where people were paying for organic food and in Chinese manufacturing, they were cutting it with conventional pea protein and it was spiking the levels of glyphosate. And I just tested Orgain last year, clean as a whistle. So that's the good news, you know, and it's not just the fact that I'm finding it. It's the fact that we're writing about it and we're sending people there to give them a little piece of their mind. You know, um, women don't like to be lied to. And in, in instances like this, whether they meant to do it or not, it, it feels like a lie and you paid top dollar for that. And you're trusting these brands to be better. So um, I'll give everybody some comfort on that because that's a big organic brand. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident their supply is, is a lot better um another yes. thing we did is huh nice um we we founded ShiftCon and that was kind of a way to organize us so ShiftCon is a is a social media conference for bloggers who are into issues like this and so we meet annually and we kind of organize the scientists with the ngos and the better brands and the influencers. So we're all under the same house for three days and we can kind of plan and then we help people. So, you know, I did that and it, it's over that time we've done what, what, what changes the most, which is the most interesting thing is kind of broaden the base of people looking for better food, looking for better personal care products, looking for better cleaning products and understanding why. And then the brands, they lose market share and they want that market share back. So of course they're going to start creating new things, you know, and categories are things that you can buy. I know that not all these brands are perfect and they've, a lot of them are really big monsters, but you know, everybody has, a, I feel like everybody has a part to play in this world. Right. And so it's kind of like a recognition of that. We're all standing together to do better things. Another thing that you wanted to know about me, which is really interesting, um, so Monsanto, I got them kicked out of the American Academy of Pediatrics after like a meeting with me. And that was pretty fun. It took about two weeks. It did one meeting and then they got, they got kicked to the can. But prior to that, which is an interesting thing, when I was organizing the labeling movement, um, they didn't like me very much at all because of course they were getting a lot of heat during labeling. And um, that year, and I think this was like about five years ago, they were trying to recruit bloggers for something other than GMOs, right? They wanted to be known for hothouse cucumbers or something like that. These other things that they do, they do a lot of other things. So they wanted to get some credit for those other things. So they wanted to recruit bloggers and very stupidly put in their um, list of questions. Are you an avid fan of Momovation? They literally called me out in front of 40, 50,000 influencers, like in a question. And then my, my phone is... Like I'm on vacation with my husband and my phone just starts like going crazy. And you know how, like, I don't know if this happens to you, but you're like at the restaurant and you're like, we're not touching the phones or we're putting it down. Right. And then it goes off and it goes off and it goes off. And you're, we're just like, I'm not going to handle it. Well, after like 13 of these texts, my husband's like, look at that. And we keep seeing my friends screenshotting all this stuff from them. So that's a little two cents right there. Mom, Monsanto hates me. They've called me out in front of people. So that's the fun part. So as this is happening, I'm drinking wine with my husband. And for a second, I was petrified. I'm like, that's like a multi-billion dollar company calling me out, like in my kitchen, you know, working, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have a big, huge office in St. Louis or wherever they are. But, um, and then I'm like, forget that. And so we toasted <laughs> as being infamous. Thank you for making me infamous. No, but really at the end of the day, I just really care about women. I care about families. I want people to feel less pain and pressure and I wanna be part of the solution. And so that's really what I'm about. Thanks Leah. 
Um, so we are coming near the end of the time. And I think that what you were just talking about there is something that I hope will inspire um, folks here. I know some of the folks on the webinar tonight are in health care professional roles, um, nurses, doctors, and, you know, it is, um, you know, telling your story from your perspective, whether you're a parent or you're a healthcare professional, really makes a difference when you're talking with legislators, when you're talking with companies. Um, we just did an advocacy day today um, for our lead policies that Senator Clear talked about a little bit. Um, and we talked to 50 offices and they always perk up when they hear a medical professional is in the room. When there's a healthcare professional, a nurse or a doctor, who can talk about their experience with patients or their expertise. Um, it, and it's remarkably easy to have these conversations. Um, and so I'm gonna quickly share um, my screen again because we have um, a couple of different kinds of actions that uh, you can uh, take. And I just wanna make sure that we get a chance to talk about them. The personal care products bill, it's a Safe Personal Care and Cosmetics Act um, and poisoning prevention policies that we are seeking to advance. Um, the links to uh, both of these in the chat um, so folks can see it. Um, and we hope would encourage you to um, hop on over to these links and um, send messages to uh, your uh, legislators and um, you know let them know that you support uh, taking action. Um, but it's also really easy to make phone calls and it's really easy to um, talk to your friends about what you've learned tonight and share the news, um, and we hope that you will. Um, and uh, I just wanna, if you can see my slide, say thank you so much. I wanna really thank uh, all of our speakers, um, Leah and Janet and Senator Clear. Um, you know, I really appreciate your time, but also all the work that you do to, help us understand the world and make it a better place. Um, and uh, just remind folks, this is an ongoing series. We will be sending you a link to the uh, recording of this webinar and also an invitation to come to our next webinar. Um, next month, we are gonna be talking about Earth Day and we are going to be sort of sharing a preview of the um, policies that we will be advancing in, um, at an Earth Day Advocacy Day, which we hope you will also uh, join us for. It's a great opportunity. We'll have some virtual meetings as well as some in-person meetings up in Albany. You can pick which ones you wanna do, but we'll circulate information about that. And then we'll be continuing the series all throughout the year. And we really appreciate um, all of your time and hopefully you'll sh share this with your friends and um, help us spread the word and feel free to contact us. Um, the information here will get you to Clean and Healthy New York uh, and directly to me. And um, we you know, really hope to build our strength together to, to make an impact for a healthier world for, for women and for all of us. So thank you so much to everyone for coming tonight.